Many viewers might be quite surprised to hear that I am dyslexic. I think that it's something which still somehow has quite a lot of stigma with it. Um, it often raises a lot of questions. If ever people find out I'm dyslexic, people ask me, are you allowed to be a dyslexic doctor? People ask how and why uh, someone who has dyslexia would choose to start writing a blog. And people are really keen to know how I manage with exams and essays uh, at university and particularly in medical school. Before we get into a little bit more about me, uh, I thought it was important that we talk a little bit about dyslexia so that we're all on the same page. So dyslexia is defined as a specific learning difficulty and it's an incredibly common one. So it's estimated that about 10% of the population have dyslexia to some extent. So primarily dyslexia affects people's accuracy in kind of literacy skills. So reading, writing, spelling, handwriting, um, written communication, that sort of thing. But it doesn't only impact these skills. Really what dyslexia does is it impacts how someone's brain processes information. And that includes uh, kind of brain organization, uh, information processing, and people's memory. So that information, that could be audible information, it could be information you're seeing, such as writing, or it could be information that you're remembering. It's really important here when we're talking about dyslexia is that we realize what we're saying is that there is a change in the way that people process information. Not that people are negatively affected necessarily, just that it's different somehow from the kind of stock standard. Different doesn't mean worse. There can be many positives in thinking differently. Uh, it's actually one of the skills that many people now wish they had. Lots of people who want to be entrepreneurs are now training themselves in how to think differently, how to think outside the box. And a big part of that is the way that you process information that you're gathering. Many dyslexics will attest to their brains working slightly differently and then being able to arrive at conclusions either earlier or at entirely different conclusions to their friends. Those differences can lead to strengths in creativity, in communication, and in problem solving. A really interesting thing about dyslexia is that it occurs across the full breadth of different intellectual abilities. Effectively, dyslexia has no standing on someone's IQ, and people of any IQ could be dyslexic. If anyone watching would like to learn more about dyslexia, maybe you yourself are dyslexic, you have a dyslexic friend or family, uh, I would really recommend having a look at the British Dyslexic Association website. I'm gonna link that below. And if anyone is interested in medicine and is dyslexic, then I would also really recommend the article Dyslexic Support in Medicine by the GMC, and I'll tag that below as well. All right, stepping out here, uh, this is like the outside area um, that we have at the accommodation. Um, some nice benches. Um, I'm just sitting out here. I thought I'd record the next part of the video. Got a coffee. Mm. So let's jump in. So one of the things that people ask me a lot um, and one of the big responses I got when I wrote a blog post about being a dyslexic medical student was, can you even be a, a, a dyslexic doctor? Is that allowed? And I hope if anyone gets anything from this video, um, it's that yes, of course. Uh, I really want to dispel any kind of myth there may be about there being any issue of being a medical student or a doctor and being dyslexic. Absolutely, you can be a doctor or any other healthcare professional and be dyslexic. That's not an issue. Doctors and any person with dyslexia are no less intelligent than someone who is, you know, kind of neurotypical. The UK Equity Act sets out that employers must take reasonable adjustments for people with dyslexia, such as assistive technology and a specific space in which they can use. So people with dyslexia might find it more difficult to, say, read or concentrate with um, distractions going on. They might need to use things like voice to text or text to voice programs in order to be able to read and, and write more efficiently. Not, not because they can't read or write, um, but because that's at that kind of level of efficiency. So if you're a doctor and you're having to write up an audit, if you're a doctor and you're having to write patient notes um, or write a referral or something like that, then you might want to be concentrating. You might want to be able to do that in like the most time efficient manner and for some people that might be with one of these assistive technologies. Uh, and the UK Equity Act says that workplaces have a, a legal obligation to, where possible and where fair, provide you know small changes like assistive technology to make things accessible to all. The other great thing is that there's absolutely no reason that the same techniques which help a medical student or an aspiring medical student excel academically can't be applied to being a doctor. So those same techniques that you would have taught yourself um, as a dyslexic medical student or as a dyslexic A-level student are 
you know, still applicable as a doctor. There is no danger to patients about a doctor being dyslexic. There's a ton of medical professionals who were openly dyslexic and, you know, who, who achieved great things. However, there is a clear disparity between the prevalence of dyslexia in the general population and the prevalence of dyslexia in medical students. So I've got the statistics here. 10% of the global population have dyslexia. Only between two and 5% of medical students have dyslexia. That's, that's obviously a big difference and you know, in my opinion is a bit of an issue. So why is it there's a difference between the number of medical students with dyslexia and the number of people in the general population with dyslexia? Well, so I think it's due to the difficulties faced by people with dyslexia in primary and secondary school and clearly then on to A-level and degree. Um, but I think particularly in primary and secondary where people are, that's where people are taught to kind of have self-value. That's where people start to decide what they might want to be doing in, in their career. And definitely, I think if people are taught that they're not smart, if people really struggle in primary or secondary school, then they might just never apply for medicine. There's also the issue of having to achieve the incredibly high grades you have to achieve for medicine. Uh, currently in the UK, most medical students end up achieving some ridiculous grades, like several A stars, you know, three A stars, two A stars and an A. Um, when I was applying, if you've watched the other video about my, my application to medicine, which you should, it will be up here somewhere, um, you might know that I did five A-levels because I went to a state school and was told that more was better. So I, I was kind of told quantity over quality. Um, this is completely untrue. Medical schools will look at your medical schools will look at three of your A levels. So even if you've done five, they'll only look at the three best. So I sp spread myself too thinly there, um, and ended up getting B's predominantly, which I'm still incredibly proud of. I think that was amazing, um, particularly having then been diagnosed with dyslexia at medical school afterwards. I think another part of the issue is also that medical schools are just kind of lacking understanding. There's a real lack of kind of exceptions made for medical students. So even though medical students should be making up 10% of the people applying, uh, you would think, you would hope, dyslexic students don't make up 10% of the medical student population. However, the number of medical students or the proportion of medical students with dyslexia actually is above the average for other higher education courses. So the 2-5% to 5 of medical students who have dyslexia is actually a higher average population or a higher average percent of people with dyslexia than in other higher education courses, which is interesting. Some people have suggested that people with dyslexia who then go on to achieve really good grades at uh, GCSE or A-level and then feel confident enough or are equipped with the kind of, with the grades to apply for medical school, maybe they have somehow developed tactics for coping or getting over the differences they have in their, in their learning and how they process information and they've developed these coping mechanisms which have allowed them to achieve high enough grades in school and to achieve academically and then they're able to go on to apply for medicine. Some people suggest that it's particularly those with a higher IQ who develop these kind of coping mechanisms but I, I don't think that's fair I think that's playing too much into the kind of doctor as, as, as geniuses or this kind of god complex that lots of uh, medical students and doctors have so I don't think it's fair to say that it's only people with uh, a higher IQ some kind of uh, inbuilt ability for for academia that go on to develop these coping mechanisms I think everyone with dyslexia has developed some kind of coping mechanism because they have a different way of information but they are living in a world with a kind of fixed way of processing information. So people have developed a kind of a title or a, a name for people with dyslexia who have developed these coping mechanisms um, and they call them compensated dyslexics and so supposedly um, medical students like myself who have dyslexia fall into this category of people with dyslexia who are compensating or having kind of coping mechanisms for dealing with any, any differences, dealing with any challenges they might face in education. Studies have shown that these compensated dyslexics have clearly developed effective mechanisms for study before arriving at university. And that means that they've found ways to use their different skill set, because remember, different does not mean worse, 
or negative, it just means different. And so they've found ways to use a different skill set to perform well in education and to achieve alongside people who are kind of living by a different set of rules, people who have a different way of processing that information. How did you know that you were dyslexic? Um, and I, I guess it's a bit of a tricky one. So to be dyslexic, you have to be formally diagnosed with dyslexia uh, by a specialist. You have to get a formal diagnosis, which normally includes getting a referral to that specialist to then be able to have that diagnosis. The test itself um, is kind of several hours of combination of like IQ testing. So they do lots of those kind of IQ tests, kind of abstract reasoning, non-verbal reasoning. Uh, they give you some shapes and you have to do some stuff with the shapes, that sort of thing. As a kid, I really struggled with reading and writing. Um, I was someone who didn't really read a book of my own kind of volition. I didn't choose to read a book by myself until I was maybe 11, 12. Um, and even then, that was because uh, in my family there is already quite a big emphasis on reading and learning. That's always been a big part of my life. And so I probably more did it out of finally caving to external pressure than wanting to anyway. If I ever have a look back through um, my old books, my old workbooks from when I was uh, in primary school or secondary school, uh, it's very clear that I was someone who struggled with, with writing, someone who struggled with um, doing what I was told. Uh, I actually had a look back at, through some of my old textbooks or some of my old workbooks um, from primary school and it's pretty hilarious because there are like literally months that go past when you go through my textbook and the only thing that's written on every single page is the date and the learning objectives because that's all the teachers would ever check that you'd written. They would like put learning objectives and the date on the board and then they'd come around and like check that everyone was writing those down and if you were then that was it like yeah and that's you doing the work i always did pretty well in in secondary school and primary school um i was someone who did you know i was academically bright as as all medical students are um you know no i was no no prodigy but i was bright enough to to, to be doing well in in school and probably to kind of fall under the radar of people worrying about things like dyslexia or dyscalculia. I think I managed to do well in, in secondary and primary uh, and even up to A-level because I had an understanding of the, of the content. So I understood the, the kind of the learning I needed to understand. Um, I think I never really got my head around um, exam technique. Uh, at the time, I just kind of learned ways of, of answering questions and learned ways of finding out what they were actually asking in a question rather than doing what I think lots of my classmates were doing at the time which was looking over past papers and kind of memorizing those answers. I've always been someone who's very bad at memorizing facts even now in medical school. So looking back at the, the grades that I got and, and, and my learning at the time I think I, I was obviously developing these coping mechanisms that we spoke about before. These coping mechanisms that people have written about and kind of you know compensating for being someone who has dyslexia uh, by learning to learn. I've always excelled in maths. Maths has always been the topic that I've done consistently well in. Um, I did a GCSE. I did GCSE statistics uh, in year seven, so five years early. Um, and I did that in one year, not the two. And then I did GCSE maths in year nine, and then I did A level maths uh, in year ten and eleven. A-levels were the first time that I really kind of struggled academically. Um, I, I got very good GCSEs. I was predicted very good A-level or AS grades because I'm old enough that I had to do separate AS and A-level exams. Um, so I got very good predictions. Um, but then when I did my AS exams, I ended up getting, um, what did I end up getting? An A and three Ds, I think. So despite being predicted all A stars, um, I really kind of, well, I think everyone thought that I dropped the ball and I, I really thought that I dropped the ball. I beat myself up a lot about that. Um, but I, I think it was clearly that the coping mechanisms that have worked up until GCSE were just not working anymore at A-level. I managed to then work really hard um, in my, my second year of A-levels. I, I retook a lot of exams, but particularly for biology, um, we had a lot of coursework on my curriculum. So my curriculum, um, had a really long chemistry and a really long biology coursework component to the A-level. 
and I really struggled in that. So um, I managed to get an E in my first go at the biology coursework, which is I think the first time I'd ever got an E in anything. Um, and then in my chemistry again, I, I, I really didn't do as well as I'd done in the written exams. When I realised that I was doing so badly in these in these written components, I asked for an assessment from my college. Um, but I was told that because I was doing well enough in the exams, um, and it was just the coursework that I wasn't doing well in, and because I got good enough um, GCSEs, I was told that I couldn't be dyslexic, so I was told that I wasn't allowed to have an assessment from the, um, the person who was supposed to be giving you an assessment at the college. They had this misconception, which is unfortunately very common, that people with dyslexia are not allowed or are unable to be academically bright. Um, and so I was told at the time, kind of, yeah, your, your grades are too good. What are you talking about? Don't waste my time. Uh, you can't have dyslexia. Dyslexia is not a reflection of someone's intelligence. Someone saying they have dyslexia does not mean that they are academically unable. It, it doesn't mean they're not academically bright. It doesn't mean they're not going to get good grades. It doesn't mean they're not going to go on to do amazing things. Um, it's just the current school system in the UK has to work for you know the many. Um, and it, it, it can mean that people slip through the cracks. I then sat my A-levels um, and again they predicted me all A stars for my A-levels. Um, I worked really hard. I managed to get um, A, A, B, B, B. So two A's and three B's. I got an A in maths, uh, an A in chemistry. Chemistry is the big one you need for medicine particularly. And then I got B's in further maths, physics and biology. I then took a gap year between my A-levels and my degree, uh, my medical degree, to get some life experience before jumping into another five or six or seven in the end years of education. That was a fantastic decision and that's definitely a video for another time. King's has a very good disability team and particularly in the extended degree program, uh, which is the program I'm on. So I do medicine in, in six years instead of five. Part of my objective in my first year, one of the things I knew I wanted to do was to ask for an assessment for dyslexia. I got this assessment, uh, I went in and had my, my dyslexia assessment and it was confirmed that I had dyslexia. Um, so that was fantastic to get that in my first year of medical school. It means that in all of my subsequent exams at medical school, I get extra time, uh, which is really useful. Um, it means that I have a bit of extra support I have a little bit of extra funding so that I can do things like print if I need to, so I can pay for some extra stationery and, and, and supplies like that. Now there's been kind of a fair amount of academic research into uh, medical students, particularly with dyslexia, uh, I guess because doctors have an abundance of access to, to medical students. They get to do any kind of research they want to do on medical students, will always consent. So the academic research that's been done on these medical students has found and concluded that medical students must have developed coping mechanisms before arriving in university and that's allowed them to achieve academically it's allowed them to perform above average because you need to perform above average to get into medical school whether you're someone who's uh, I don't know I, I don't know whether the average medical student has an IQ above, of above average um, but they're definitely academically achieving above average I know that some people watching this with dyslexia uh, and people without dyslexia might be looking at me and thinking, well, okay, you have dyslexia, you're a medical student, how do you, how do you cope with medical school exams and essays and coursework and all of the assessments, the constant assessment, the constant, constant assessment that you have to do as a medical student? Um, and like, how do you cope, one, and how do you do? You know, are, are you consistently performing in, in the bottom half of the year. I'm sitting here editing this video and I've realized that I've managed to, over the course of the day, ramble on about being a dyslexic medical student for more than 40 minutes. And try as I might, I've not been able to edit it down. There is, there's so much that I wanna be able to say in this video that I think it's gonna to have to be two videos. Um, I asked some people over on Instagram and everyone seemed to be more happy with two 20 minute videos than a single 40 minute video. So we're gonna to have to cut it here, pick up next time with a part two of being a dyslexic medical student. So I hope to see you then too. Thanks so much.